For some, roller coasters mean pleasure and excitement, the ultimate thrill. But for others, they're sheer terror. So how can the designers predict what effect the ride will have on its passengers? Take a look now at the mathematics behind the jerk and the jounce. It's 6.30 one morning in late summer at Alton Towers Amusement Park. Phil is part of the regular maintenance crew checking out the Nemesis ride for safety. He'll look at every one of the 716 meters of track and every one of the 7,400 bolts. The suspension is checked on both the 32-seater trains, which each carry up to 1,400 passengers an hour. Only when the operations crew is satisfied do the cars make their way from the maintenance bay onto the track for the first passengerless test runs of the day. And only when the crew is completely confident is the ride handed over to the presentation staff who will run it. Later, the first paying customers of the day follow the crew around the track, and you begin to see why the Alton Towers staff took so much care. I'm just shaking. I just, I mean, it's, it's just an experience. You're here, there, and everywhere. I just. I looked once and that was bad enough. I was going to see his feet and arms flying in the I was a bit nervous to start with, but since I got on, it's okay. But I don't know, it seemed to be all over very quickly, that's anything. Thank you. I'm still shaking. <laughs> it's fashionable to be frightened, and the designers of rides know it. Successful amusement rides are big business. A market leading ride might cost 10 million to design and build. In this programme, we're going to try to understand why they're built that way. A combination of engineering, psychology and physiology. Design starts two to three years before the rides are built to allow for independent cross-checks and for arguments between the different design responsibilities. But when Nemesis was installed, it was chosen to have this effect on the passengers, this effect on the supports, and to miss the cosmetic decoration, the theming, by just this amount. Even the fact that the initial ascent is a long, slow haul is part of the game. It's more likely to build anticipation than an elevator. Long before the first passengers joined a lengthy queue, the designers knew exactly how fast they would be traveling subsequently and what forces they would feel at every stage of the following terrifying, delicious, scary, and horrific 90-odd seconds. The trouble with understanding a ride like this one is that it's too complex. The track's all over the place, let alone the forces and accelerations you have to understand. Even stripped of everything but the essentials, it's hard to work out what's going on. What you need is a mathematical model of the behavior of the ride. And here, you can learn from the designers. They ignore the twists over the geographical map and model the acceleration you experience meter by meter along the track. The coordinates are those of the riders. 
up, wherever that is, temporarily, sideways and forwards. So you end up with a profile of the track. And now you can explore how Nemesis affects its riders. We mounted a camera on the front for a grandstand view of how they looked. And then we added the track profile. As we're carrying our coordinates around with us, up is the top of the screen. That's where the sky is, for the moment. You'll see this sequence again later, when we add in the forces experienced by the riders. But to understand those forces, you need to take a look at some older, simpler amusement rides. We took an OU academic, a psychologist, and an engineer on a tour of the amusement parks to find out why we're scared and what the designers are worried about. This first ride, the rotor, is a bit like putting people in a spin dryer. Basically, right. you're just making them whiz round and round and round. And it seems so simple to me, I can't imagine what's thrilling about it. Well, I think with most fairground rides, what thrills is the fact it gives you an experience which is so very different from anything you'd normally have in everyday life. And in this case, I think what usually gets people is the point where they drop the floor away. You're going so fast that the centrifugal force throws you against the wall. They lower the floor, your feet are left in mid-air, and the world isn't supposed to be like that, so of course everyone screams. <laughs> what sort of accelerations are involved in this one then, Gary? Uh, well, this particular type of ride, the acceleration can be as high as 6G, which is rather higher than you'd find on a roller coaster. This particular one seems to be about 4G. This is the centrifugal force acceleration into the wall. It's natural to think that the riders are being forced back against the wall. But the mathematicians prefer to model what the wall is doing to the rider, producing an equal and opposite reaction. The wall produces a force of four times body weight, an acceleration of 4G. The rider's weight pulls them down. Friction pulls them up. We can combine friction and weight in a single acceleration. When you combine that with the one from the wall, it comes down to just one acceleration in this direction. Normally, you'd experience that only if you were lying backwards, which is just what a rotor rider feels. The next ride we're going to look at is the Yankee Flyer. It introduces the next bit of complication, because instead of whirling people around this way, like the rotor, with a constant outward acceleration, it whirls people around this way, which means we have two accelerations to worry about. We have the outward acceleration, and we also have the acceleration due to gravity associated with weight. The essential design feature of the Yankee Flyer is to get the rotational speed correct. You choose that so that the acceleration produced radially is just less than that due to gravity. I imagine that's quite important, because what about at the top, if you... Yes, that, that's, that's the point. At the top, you're nearly weightless, but you don't want to be totally weightless. We don't want the passenger to leave contact with the seat. We don't want him bouncing when he lands. So, again, we have a constant acceleration, but one that's changing in direction. As before, we look at what the ride is doing to the passenger. As it rotates, it adds this to what the rider already experiences. It affects the rider's weight by a varying amount. At the top, it acts against it. At the bottom, it reinforces it. In between, its vertical contribution varies. So the upward acceleration on the rider, felt as weight, varies between naught and 2G. Peter, am I right in thinking that with the Yankee Flyer, the most thrilling thing is the near weightlessness at the top? Yes, I'm sure that has to be one of the high points, you might say. Um, it's an unusual experience for people to feel that they're just about to leave their seats. And, of course, the opposite at the bottom, where you suddenly feel heavier, like a roller coaster. But there is more to it than that. As you were explaining, as it revolves, the outward acceleration, it's always along a radius. 
And that means that, for example, over at our side here, when it's at about nine o'clock, you've got the acceleration that way, plus gravity still downwards, and the resultant at about 45 degrees. Now, normally, I'd only experience that kind of feeling if I was leaning over like this. But here, the passenger knows he's still sitting perfectly upright and experiencing this revolving force as if he was turning cartwheels. Uh, and the result is that, again, there's this mismatch between what the eyes and everything tell you and the gravity sensor in your head is saying that you're turning over and you probably feel rather sick as you get off. Now that we've seen the effects of accelerations when they're relatively constrained, it's time to put them together and look at a roller coaster, albeit one simpler than Nemesis and without the theming. Right, well, this is the typical starting point for a roller coaster where the train has to be got out of a low level station and um, be given some potential energy to convert into subsequent velocity. Uh, this is the powered section of the circuit where the uh, roller chain will carry it up to the top. And just this side of the roller chain is uh, um, a ratchet device, which is actually an anti-rollback safety device um, in case the train should decide to roll back towards the station. Of course, from the psychological point of view, for the rider, who's not worried about building up potential energy, what all this does is building up the anxiety level as they gradually gain height and the clicking of the ratchet all the time all adds to the tension. The designer now wants to use this potential energy in as thrilling a way as possible, and that comes down to what can be contrived with the accelerations. So how do they vary around this ride? Well, after the lift, uh, we've now got our potential energy that we can convert into velocity. And here we come into our first uh, dip, where we've got a, a significant force into the uh, seat of the car. The track's still horizontal from side to side, of course, at that point. There's no camber, so the sensations that people have is merely that they're upright, but they're being pressed into their seat a bit harder. That's right, yes. And of course, when we get up here, we've started to introduce a bit of camber to get round uh, the first bend. Um, but the velocity is fairly low and it's a fairly slight camber. Uh, the track of the, uh, uh, then comes round and through another dip, but by the time we get round here, we've got about our third dip. And at this point, uh, we've got a very tight vertical radius just over um, a short distance. And at that point, there's a high force into the car. Then as we go up and round again, uh, you can see now that we've got a, a much more cambered track, if you can compare with the uh, track above it. Uh, we have more velocity there, and the camber is required to stop uh, uh, the passengers being thrown from side to side against the shoulder restraints to keep the force directed uh, into the seat. And that's at right angles to the track. That's that at point. right angles to the track. So in a sense, of course, the forces are always downwards, which is what people experience normally in everyday life. It's that's just that they feel that they're weighing a little more. That's the aim, yes. A nice feature about this bit is that as you come out of that bend and down the slope, you're rushing towards these two pillars and the other piece of track above the top. And, of course, there's bags of clearance, but approaching it at speed, it's very hard to make that assessment. And you find that even in very young babies, if something rushes towards their faces, they'll try to blink and flinch. And typically, of course, with roller coaster riders, you do see them all duck at this point of the ride. Yes, well, it, uh, the other interesting feature to me is the uh, change from a right-handed curve into a left-handed curve as it crosses the centre of the ride here. And what this is actually meaning is that we have to have a rapid change in camber angle and the track has to adjust and twist around so that we can balance the forces again into the seat. Well, we're getting towards the end of the ride now, and we're spiralling down with increasing velocity uh, into the tightest part of the circuit. Uh, the total forces are at a maximum round here, and by the time we get round here, we've got to have a very steep camber angle. So at this point, we're probably looking at something in excess of 45 degrees. And yet, of course, although it's cambered like that, the forces are still perpendicular to the track so the riders still feel this tremendous force down through the seat. 
the greatest yet, so it's quite an experience for them. And interestingly, of course, although their balance organs are all telling them that down is in that direction, their eyes are telling them that the horizontal is in that direction. And it's that kind of mismatch which generally produces things like travel sickness. And I'm sure that if people were on this ride for long enough, they would get quite sick. This ride at Wicksteed Park is child's play compared with Nemesis, and yet even this one could make you sick. What might Nemesis do? It was exhilarating to begin with, but I felt really sick towards the end of it. The twists and turns were, were terrible, particularly the final ones. And when you thought it was over and then suddenly there was this terrible twist and down at the end, that made me feel really sick. It was extremely fast and feel quite sick on the ride. Um, it is all the twists and turns that actually make you feel very, very sick. My legs at the moment are very shaky still. Um, it was a good ride though. It was, it was worth going on. Gary, now we're far enough away we can hear ourselves think a bit. Uh, let's discuss the design of the Nemesis. I mean, the first thing that strikes you is that people are being whirled in every possible direction. Um, from the design point of view, what does that involve? Well, the modern generation of roller coaster has introduced the, the possibility of turning the passengers upside down. The designers realise that they'll accept this. And this actually means that we can now introduce vertical loops, helices and various other shapes. And it generates, of course, a very complicated looking shape ge geometrically um, and something like a, a sort of Gordian knot that has to be unravelled so that we can find out the accelerations that are going to affect the passengers. So let's start unravelling the Gordian knot. What do people expect from a ride like Nemesis? Looking forward to it? Yes, thank you. What do you expect it to feel like? Terrible. <laughs> Scared stupid? But it's still worth doing. Yeah. It, it's the scariness that makes it good. Yeah. But you're going to go nevertheless. I'm going all the same, yeah. How do you expect to feel? Terrible. It's your first time here? It is. Looking forward to it? Uh, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> what do you expect it to feel like? Uh, painful. <laughs> I think it's going to scare the living daylights out of me, actually. But you enjoy being scared? Yeah. How do you expect it to feel other than terrible? What will it, you've been on roller coasters before. Frightening. It's very fast. Everyone expects to be scared, and some people think it's the speed that does it. It's not. This display is speed along the track. It never rises above the maximum of 80 kilometers per hour, less than most people drove to the park at. So if it isn't speed, what is it? So which bits have been designed to be the most thrilling, do you think? Well, the positions where the accelerations are highest, and those typically, of course, are the lowest points on the track, uh, where you've got the highest kinetic energy, highest velocity. So how does acceleration vary as you ride Nemesis? This display is showing the acceleration in the up direction, what the rider feels through their seat. It's more variable than speed, and changes between a maximum of 4G and zero, which is weightlessness. But that's much less than the rotor. You could feel 6G there and still not be scared. This third display, here it's negative, is part of the reason. It's how fast the acceleration changes, something roller coaster engineers call jerk. On the rotor, the jerk display would remain firmly set at zero. On Nemesis, it's adding to the thrill. There was jerk change in acceleration on the Yankee Flyer 2, but there it was constant. On Nemesis, the jerk changes. The engineers even have a word for that change. It's jounce, the rate at which the jerk is changing. It's not a large change, but notice it isn't constant. Speed, acceleration, jerk, and jounce. To the designer, it's the jerk that counts. 
What about the way the acceleration is changing? Does that have something to do with it? Yes, uh, th that uh, is the jerk, of course, and we want the jerk to be contained within reasonable levels. Uh, this has implications for the structures. And uh, the jerk, of course, changes um, where the uh, transitions in the, in the tracks from one radius to another occur. And what about on the corkscrewing bits? On the corkscrewing bits, of course, you've got a continuously changing um, uh, acceleration. And uh, the camber can normally be uh, uh, chosen so that the acceleration changes smoothly. In that situation, the jerk is quite low. So the key to the design is the choice of camber, then? Absolutely, yes. Get the camber right and you avoid the side forces and you keep the jerks uh, within reasonable values. The sideways accelerations we want to limit. We don't want the passengers thrown too much from side to side, and nor do we want those sideways forces on the structures. It introduces stresses that are undesirable in the long term. Gary's reminded us that the accelerations on the passengers aren't everything. The structure has to be safe as well, and so do the riders, which is why they have to measure up too. So, how was it then? I don't know, I couldn't get on the machine. Well, that's a bit mean. Yeah, my chest was too big, I couldn't oh, get the guard to lock. Bad luck. So my wife's on there. <laughs> so we'll have to ask her what it was yeah, like. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't fit on. But there's still hope for those who don't fit onto Nemesis. Perhaps this kind of thing is where the future lies. Take a platform and mount it on three hydraulic jacks. Control the hydraulic jacks with a programmable controller into which you've fed all the forces and resulting accelerations and changes of acceleration that you would expect from a ride that you've already filmed. Put a passenger cabin on top of your platform and project a film of the ride in front of the passengers and subject them to all the rises and falls and tilts and jerks that you would expect during the ride. And lo and behold, you've got the fairground simulator. It wasn't as convincing as I hoped it would be, but it was um, enjoyable. It was very jerky, but um, definitely not as good as a real thing. Once you got going, you really did feel like you were on the roller coaster. Um, there was a feeling of acceleration, but nothing like what I would have expected from the size of the ramp that it was in, giving the impression it was going down. I think if you'd been on the real ride that had been used for that, it would have been totally different. A simulator can operate virtually anywhere, at any time of the day, all night. Once you're inside the box, the experience is always the same. When you're coming up to go over an hill, it's like you're going up to go over this hill and you're thinking, now, I wonder what's going to happen when it goes over the other side. It shoots you forward like that and you sort of get a grip. It's, it's quite good, really. Um, it made it feel really real. <laughs> It might not be quite as real as Nemesis, but it models the jerk and the jounce. Whether it replaces all the fun of the fair is another question. 